production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly Food for Thought flight, where we fight tooth and nail, and sometimes tongue in cheek, over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckets join me shortly in our topics this week, the safety pin spin, the future of plaza carriage spins, and another spin on the Kansas budget, plus roast and toast. But we start with our interview segment and talk about the federal government's involvement in education and how it might change under the new Trump administration. The president-elect has nominated billionaire Bessie DeVos, chair of the American Federation for Children, to be secretary of education. Her nomination has been applauded by advocates of school choice and denounced by teachers' unions. To talk more about education in general, and DeVos in particular, we welcome Michael McShane, Director of Education Policy at the Show Me Institute in Kansas City. Michael's a former high school teacher and holds a Ph.D. in education. Welcome back to Ruckus. Good uh, to see you again. Thanks so much for having me. Always a pleasure. I heard President-elect Trump the other day say this. The United States spends more money on education than any other country in the world, but its test results are far from being the best in the world. Is he right? That is true. I mean, maybe Luxembourg might beat us, but we, uh, we tend to be towards the top in spending and sort of middling or, or slightly below for, uh, for our test results. When I was studying to be a teacher decades ago at Northwest Missouri State University, we were told that education was a state and local matter. But over the years, it seems the federal government has gotten much more involved. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a sort of push after Sputnik. The real big federal kind of push came during the Johnson administration. That's when they first passed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which sort of started this slow march. Many people are probably familiar with No Child Left Behind, which was an even sort of bigger step in that. But it's still true that education is predominantly a state and local issue. Generally, they spend about, the Fed spend about 10 cents on every education dollar, the rest coming from local sources and state sources. Well, what does it do? Why does it exist? exist? What's its role? Well, really, the two largest federal programs in terms of dollars provide for Title I, which is funding for low-income students and funding for students with special needs. Now, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that gets mixed into there, but when you want to talk in dollars and cents, terms in K-12 education. Now, there's still higher ed with Pell Grants and student loans and all of that, but with K-12 education, the two largest budget items are for those kids. But they provide money to school districts, they right? They do. And yes. school districts have to conform to what the federal government wants to get that money. Yes, that's exactly right. An old friend of mine has a saying, the federal government is, is good at making uh, people do things. It's not necessarily good at making them do it well. Uh, and that's, I think, an a, a eternal problem with federal education policy. As always, Michael, there is mixed reaction to a cabinet nominee <laughs> and certainly for Betsy DeVos. What is the argument for her? What do her advocates say? I mean, she's been a passionate advocate for school choice for almost three decades now, uh, both in her native Michigan and around the country. And it's an issue that's been gaining salience all across the country. More and more states are expanding charter schools, looking at private school choice as well. So I think she's really kind of riding the tide of this school choice wave that's happening all across the country. All right, the teachers' unions don't like her. What is their argument against her? Well, I think the exact inverse of that. They tend to be more skeptical of school choice, not as in favor of charter schools, especially not in favor of things like school vouchers or others. So the, the same reason her supporters like her is the same reason many of her detractors don't. Cliff Notes, uh, if you will, give us your Cliff Notes version of what Common Core is, because oh there's a big question oh, about there whether is. Betsy DeVos is for or against Common Core. Yeah, so the Common Core was a set of standards, so goals that students were supposed to reach at a particular time that were agreed upon initially by a group of governors and chief state school officers, really pushed by the Obama administration for more and more states to, to adopt them. And it's unclear exactly... Right now, Betsy DeVos is saying that she is opposed to the Common Core, but some of the organizations that she was affiliated with had been supportive at the time. So I think she has some explaining to do, particularly for people on the political right, as to where that change happened. But hasn't Donald Trump said he's against Common Core? Oh, he's Core? completely against so it, it really wants to get matter, rid of it. It really doesn't matter what Betsy DeVos thinks, I think does it, in the long run. Uh, when you're talking about a cabinet secretary, the president makes the final decision. I think that's exactly right, yes. Do you think this nomination is going to be difficult to confirm for Republicans in the Senate, but 
Uh, you know, it seems to me it's going to be a bit of a battle, but not a, a serious yeah, one. I think that the Common Core skirmish is out there. I think they have the ability to clear that up. And I think there are probably other cabinet nominees that are going to be taking more of the heat. So I don't expect a huge fight, but, you know, stranger things have happened. Uh, one of your colleagues told me there's some speculation nationally that you might be asked to join oh. the Department of Education, <laughs> the federal level. Oh, boy. If I had to leave Kansas City, I'd miss all the great programming <laughs> on KCPT, which might be a cross too heavy to bear. Are you saying you're not willing to take a look at it? Oh, listen, if, if people want to reach out to me, I'll, I'll always listen, but it would be, it would be a tough sell. Hey, great. Uh, don't leave Kansas City. We need you here. Thanks <laughs> Thank for coming you. in this morning. Thank you. That is Michael McShane with the Show Me Institute in Kansas City. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. John Stevens heads Rock Hill Strategic. Attorney and former three-term mission mayor Laura McConwell makes her premier appearance on Ruckus. Laura, great to have you with us. Thank you. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant and prominent influential attorney. Steve Marakian <laughs> is with the firm of Worsh, Hobbs & Marakian. Thanks, as always, Steve, for writing your introduction for me. <laughs> in the current controversy on the Country Club Plaza, mm -hmm. there is no horseplay involved. It is indeed serious business to advocates on both sides of a battle centering on a local tradition. Animal rights activists are calling for a ban on horse-drawn carriages in the plaza. Others, including the company running the carriage business, oppose the ban, saying it's an overreaction. The dispute stems from December the 3rd when a horse named Tiny pulling a carriage <laughs> began running out of control, crashing into a fence at Ward Parkway in Warnell. The collision threw the horse, the driver, and three passengers to the ground. The horse and passengers suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Now, of course, most of us love horses and other animals, want them kept safe and secure, but we also like traditions such as the Country Club Plaza carriage rides. So, John, do we have to abandon one to have the other, or do you think we can have both? I think you can have both. Um, the An outright ban I don't think is the answer. Uh, I think that in 96... There was a discussion and some policies put in place uh, to better account for the health of the animals, well-being of the animals, and pr provide the businesses some support. I think 20 years later, it's time that we have those conversations again. So I, I am hopeful that the city council will look at that and maybe take it a step further and look at more of the true pedestrian traffic safety on the plaza, which I think is the big. Like doing issue. what? Revamping the traffic routes on the. I think. I think. Plaza? I think uh, traffic dampening on some of those roads. I think you look at 47th Street. There is very fast traffic. And I think the, the bigger risk is to pedestrians in that area. I think the city needs to look at a holistic walkability approach, and that includes the carriages as well. Mary, you've spent a lot of time on the plaza, lived <laughs> on the have. plaza in the past, <laughs> yes. uh, probably I've still down there quite a bit. On horseback. Uh, <laughs> what, 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 do you think? What, 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 what do you think about the, the carriage rides? Actually, I spent 11 years. You've got it, you've got it right. I, you know, I'm very, I feel very, uh, have lots of affection for the plaza, and I think it's, it's romantic, the carriages, and, it, and it, it adds charm that really is quite wonderful. I mean, the poor people who were hurt were from Topeka. They came here to ride the carriages. That'll teach them. And so that'll <laughs> teach them, right. I, um, there have been two incidences since yeah. 1996. Right. Is that correct, John? Correct. And I, I think that's a remarkably good mm -hmm. uh, average one every decade or so. And it, from all what I've been able to find out, uh, the city is uh, doing a good job of regulating. They, they inspect to see that the horses have their best shoes on. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> I, I think that animals like having a job. Yeah. I really do. I mean, where would they be if they weren't? At the uh, unemployment pulling? office. That's where they'd be. <laughs> uh, Laura, I don't know much about horses, but I have been to the plaza a lot. And, and looking at them, watching them, they seem to be perfectly happy. The horses don't seem to be uh, suffering. Horses have been used throughout the century to, to cart folks around and to do work. Uh, it's my understanding that the city does have the regulations and the horses are inspected and in extreme weather that the horses are changed out so that no horse is out there for a long time um, and so their health is maintained. I think it is, I don't remember when they, there weren't horses on the plaza and in carriage rides and I think it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I don't disagree with John that the city council, if, they, if it's been 20 years since you've had the it last has. time to re review some of the rules, it's yeah. probably prudent to do that to maintain the safety of the horses and also for the, the 
patrons that are down on the plaza. Um, it is a multimodal environment and you could check how the horses and the cars work, but I don't think you force out the horses in favor of the cars. That's not what the plaza is. The plaza is about an experience, and I think those carriage rides are part of it. Steve, multimodal means many ways of getting around, in case you were wondering. <laughs> <laughs> multimodal. Well, who's this mogul you're talking about? <laughs> I'll ask you something. Uh, pulling a carriage doesn't seem to be nearly as difficult as running a race or being engaged in a steeplechase. So, I mean, if horses can do those things without suffering or being treated inhumanely, why would you think pulling a carriage around the plaza would be inhumane treatment? Well, you wouldn't think that, Mike, except for the fact that you are someone who obviously hates animals. You probably, <laughs> you probably want to keep elephants in the circuses. You have no concern whatsoever for people who kill mosquitoes and flies. You're a horrible person. This is a, an entirely contrived controversy. Clearly, people in Kansas City uh, have ridden in the, in the carriages for years very safely. Thousands and thousands of people come to the plaza partially because they love the atmosphere. It had the same thing in New York. You have horse-drawn carriages throughout the United States. The, these, these horses, as long as they are treated humanely, treated well, and there are some traffic regulations, uh, there's clearly, clearly no reason to get rid of the carriages. And this is simply a, one of those things where those who are activists, the ones who are, who, who are in favor of this, are using this as a contrived crisis to create a controversy where none exists. Keep the carriage, stop the demonstrations on the plaza. Would well, you go along with stop that? Stop all demonstrations everywhere. <laughs> that's, uh, that's just, just to wrap it up, uh, John, who, who will have the final decision on this? The city council of Kansas City? Yeah, I, I think it'll be the city council. And, uh, you know, as I said, I, I, I somewhat agree with Steve, but we have to look. I do think that it is important. It's not a contrived controversy, but it should stimulate some discussion by the council just to take a fresh look at is everything being right. done to make sure that things are, are managed properly. Are, are these online petitions meaningful? I mean, you don't take an online petition to City Hall, do you, and say conduct an election based on this? In my experience of working with KCMO City Hall, sometimes the online petitions do at least raise the 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 issue to have a discussion, but they don't make much don't, of a change. Don't tell Clay Chess. I know. <laughs> all right. I know. Kansas City Star columnist Murray Sanchez has a spin on almost everything, including, as we recently learned, safety pins. Sanchez blasts the Shawnee Mission School District for telling teachers and staff that wearing them to school is inappropriate political speech. Now, in case you missed it, after the recent presidential election, safety pins have taken on sociological and political implications. Wearing one, according to the columnist, signifies, and I quote, solidarity with people who are feeling threatened, immigrant, gay and lesbian people, women and Muslims. Sanchez argues that many students are having deep feelings of anxiety about deporting immigrants and rolling back civil rights gains. Apparently, seeing a safety pin on a teacher reassures a troubled student. So, Steve, our question, does a teacher need a safety pin to reassure troubled students? This is another one of those faux controversies that is just such nonsense. It's really hardly worthy of discussion, but since we're discussing it today, the notion that a high school teacher wearing a safety pin is necessary to protect our little snowflakes from, from their soiling their collective diapers because Donald Trump is a big scary man is simply a contrivance of what I would call the, the, the echo chamber syndrome. Some on the left are only tolerant of leftist thought. The conservative, Christian, patriotic views, there's no place for them in the public discourse. For some liberals and some leftists, free speech is only free if you agree with it. This is absolute nonsense. The ACLU has it partially right here, okay? Teachers can wear safety pins as long as teachers and students can wear crosses, can wear t-shirts with slogans, can display flags of all kind. Uh, and, and if I want to wear my, my, uh, my, my Donald Trump t-shirt, then you can wear your Che Guevara t-shirt. But the notion that you have to have a teacher with a safety pin, otherwise you're going to be traumatized, pro pro promise is me just <laughs> nonsense. Promise me this, Steve. Next time you're on Ruckus, you'll wear your Make America Great Again cap that you have. I, I, I will do that. I'll do that along with my multiple different flags <laughs> from multiple countries showing my, uh, my diversity Mary, and, and, and love for all It seems like we used to complain that children don't pay enough attention to the news. Now, perhaps they're paying too much. Well, I, no, this... <laughs> 
I, I was a teacher for eight years, and I sometimes taught junior high school students and high school kids. Um, what's, what this is about, Steve, is about actually a global uh, solidarity that, that's being expressed all over the, uh, the Western world uh, the, for children and others who feel threatened by the movements in, in various countries to exclude people, Muslims and others, the divisive politics of the far right, white nationalism has raised its ugly head in a very strong way in this country. And children come to school having absorbed what their parents are experiencing. And if there are immigrant children, uh, uh, Spanish-speaking kids, uh, black kids, uh, gay children that feel that they're not safe or accepted, by a teacher wearing this symbol of acceptance. Um, well, what would it mean if a teacher doesn't wear the safety well, it, pin that he or she mean, doesn't care? Well, of course not. It, well, then you know, what's we the value of it? Well, there's no need to make uh, these expressions uniform. Uh, uh, the teachers have a right to do this. And by the way, uh, Prince, uh, the Superintendent Hinson of the Astronomy Mission District, my goodness, what a strange and, and unacceptable a comparison of the teacher yes. who brought a Confederate flag yes. to school and comparing that to people, teachers who wear this symbol. Well, they're both in appropriate political speech is the position but he took. But a Confederate flag is not allowed anywhere in the United States. In yes, public, it is. In a public building, is. you may not display I, I, I gotta, gotta move a Confederate on here. Uh, flag. Uh, Laura, uh, Mary Sanchez says students are worried about rolling back civil rights and immigrate, uh, or deporting people who are here. Has Donald Trump rolled back any civil right yet or not deported that. anybody? No, not that I'm aware of. And I mean, this is where you get the rhetoric versus the action. And, you know, and I'll give you an example. I have, my nieces are in grade school and they live in Springfield and they have a friend who's of a Mexican origin who was born in this country, as were her parents, and there were other classmates telling this young girl she's going to get deported if Donald Trump gets elected president, which is nonsense because they're American citizens. Yeah. And so I think there are a lot of, there's a, a lot, people are afraid. There's a lot of scare tactics. I think it was a very divisive election, and we need to, we need to, we need to calm down. And it's my understanding about the safety pins in Shawnee Mission is that students were told that the teachers that did not have safety pins weren't safe. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, every teacher should be a safe person in a yeah. school. Who told the teachers that? Who told the kids yeah. that? that? Other they... teachers with sa safety pin really? teachers. Uh, wrap this up. That. Uh, yeah. uh, if the campaign, the presidential campaign, is responsible for all of this difficulty, are both sides of the campaign responsible? Yeah, I, I mean, I think potentially. I mean, Mrs. Clinton said some pretty harsh things about Donald yes, Trump. Yes, but I, I think everybody can everybody can agree that that the campaign rhetoric, whether it becomes a reality when uh, the president-elect becomes president in January, th that rhetoric was a pretty extreme rhetoric, which campaigns go extreme. This one it, took it to a new know, level. It might be better for teachers to explain the way American government works, that a president doesn't just come into office and make things happen. There's a Congress and a Supreme Court, <laughs> and there is a process that Certainly. is the, followed. The tripartite system It would be helpful if they would explain a little bit about I American history is, and the fact, Mary, and we're going to wrap it up, <laughs> that is, Barack Obama has deported more people from this country than any president in American so history. So why weren't children afraid Kansas of City it? Star <laughs> Our columnist Steve Rose says there may be a way out of Kansas financial problems without raising taxes. The plan involves taking money and property that have accumulated over decades in the state's unclaimed property fund to cover the current estimated budget gap of about $350 million. For the untold millions the state Supreme Court will likely order for school finance, Rose says there's yet another option short of raising taxes, selling anticipated future proceeds from the state's settlement with tobacco companies, money now earmarked for early childhood education. Rose does not endorse the plans, but do either or both of them sound viable to you, Laura? Uh, I don't think either sound viable. The, the first plan that he talked about um, with regard to the unclaimed property that's in the coffers of the Kansas State Treasurer, that's property that's not owned by the state, it's owned by something else, Some is owned by other individuals, and this, the state does invest those, and the gains from those invested funds are already being used. So 
it, it, it doesn't create any new dollars or any new money, and the state's not going to essentially steal other people's property to get. To is the there state not office. a time limit on how long that property has to be maintained? Well, I, mean, I don't know for sure. I no, just I mean it's unc <laughs> unclaimed property, and it's in, and that is that's where it's going to sit until the the heirs or the people that it's their property. What happens is, is the state gets something, they hold it for a period of time, then they liquidate it, and then that cash goes into the fund. Um, All right, how about this other thing okay, about the other uh, tobacco? On the tobacco, I, I, I hope not. I mean, early childhood, early childhood education is important, and you know, they, they, they created a settlement and they designed that it was going to go towards early childhood education, and I think it would be a real disservice to the the citizens of the state and for the legislators to decide, well, no, we didn't really make a promise and then change the direction of those funds. Well, what about this next session of the Kansas legislature? Sure. Apparently it's going to be more moderate, uh, so we're told. Uh, do you expect changes? Do you expect to see some of these issues that are longstanding to be resolved? I do. I, I, I think that the LLC loophole, I think that will be repealed. But the problem is that doesn't start hitting coffers until 2018. Right. So there is an immediate problem, and, and I agree with Laura. It would be a shame, but I don't think that there is really any other option than these two digging under the couch, you know, digging under the cushions of the couches again <laughs> to try to find that last bit of... Oh, that well, if it's illegal, you, you can't do it if it, Well, if the question illegal. is, I, I think, you know, the determination is, is it illegal? And selling the tobacco funds certainly oh, is... It's, is it illegal? Think, they shouldn't do it. I'm saying it's a, it's a. Well, don't you think Steve was was half a joking in this column? He wasn't serious. Well, I, I thought mean, he was there's serious. There's not any possibility that these two cockamamie ideas would take care of the 900. What is it? 960 million dollars we are currently. Well, the first one was the, fir the first solution was for 350 million dollars. I understand. The other was for whatever we're million th number. We're 350 million Court behind this for. Year. This year, exactly, and that's what he was and talking starting about. Starting very and the other, soon now, the we have to, revenues would be used well, to offset LL, whatever school but finance Mike, here's the increases. Problem. We have to come up with almost a billion dollars before we even begin talking about anything new well, and hoping ask, everything do, goes well. All right, Steve, do, do you have some hope for this new legislature? And, and do you think Brownback's about to leave? <laughs> I don't think he's about to leave. Um, I do have hope for the new legislature, and I do think that there have been some some uh, some tax plans uh, bandied about that I think do make sense. I don't think Steve was. Uh, I think he was serious. I don't. I, I, I do agree that it's not going to work. He was critical uh, of the plans, but he was saying, yeah, I thought yeah, that they I, could work. I mean, uh, I think I think Steve was was really more on track uh, with the idea that uh, that the, one of the ways to help the budget deficit, not resolve the entire thing, of course. Uh, has to do with the Supreme Court stepping out and not ordering hundreds of millions of more dollars. And in fact, going back, uh, the legislature going back through the local option budget, which would help us with our funds there. Okay, got to stop at this point. It is time now to head to the soapbox for roast and toast, <laughs> where the Ruckettes have 30 seconds to celebrate or decimate people and events in the news. And we begin with Muriel Halloran. Well, Merry Christmas to all our viewers and uh, Happy New Year. But I'm going to have to end the year on a roast, and a double roast for the president-elect and for Governor Brownback. I mean, Governor Brownback actually said this morning in the Kansas City Star, if I could have any wish, I would like to say that at the end of my term, I would be able to say hi to people and, and know that I was a positive, made a positive contribution to their soul. Governor, <laughs> stay in Topeka. Don't go. Don't take that ambassadorship and fix the unbelievable destruction that you have brought about to the budget and to the programs in the state of Kansas. All right, John. Sure. Uh, I want to give a hopeful toast to the discussions going on with uh, citizens of Kansas City, Missouri on the general obligation bonds. Uh, initiative that's coming up. I think it's a positive discussion looking at that these should rightfully focus on sidewalks, complete streets, repairing, replacing neighborhood infrastructure and other improvements, not on roadway expansion, not on new projects in far-flung areas of Kansas City, Missouri that would just add long-term costs to uh, the taxpayer. All right, Steve Marakian. I'm toasting President-elect Donald Trump for his stellar cabinet selections thus far. If Trump were an NFL general manager, he'd be putting together a Super Bowl contender. What we need in order to turn this country around is idea people, not ideologues. 
professionals, not professors, and winners, not whiners. This is what Trump promised. This is what he's giving us. Trump was overwhelmingly elected to change the trajectory of America and to restore its place as leader of the free world. He is doing that. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. And Laura. I'm going to give a, um, a toast. This week, Johnson County Sheriff Frank Denning is retiring, as is under Sheriff Kevin Kavanaugh. These men have had a number of years of fine, dedicated service in law enforcement, both in the sheriff's office and in also municipal police departments. They have done good work keeping our community safe um, and helping move us forward, and I wish them well as they move on into their next careers and hope they're not strangers. And finally, here's a toast to the book titled A Torch Kept Lit, Great Lives of the 20th Century. It features eulogies written by the late William F. Buckley of National Review and Firing Line fame. The 50-plus people eulogized range from Elvis Presley to Alger Hiss. One suggestion, when reading Buckley, it's best to keep a dictionary close by, <laughs> if only for epistemological empiricism or an existential panegyric. <laughs> and that is Ruckus for this week. Back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckus and crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night. Production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Thank you.